So good morning, everybody. Uh, as you all know, that unfortunately we could not have the session yesterday because uh, Professor Ravindra Kumar was suddenly taken ill and had to be hospitalized. I mean, and I think all of us are kind of, uh, very correctly said, have to reckon with the uncertainties of time. Uh, hopefully, he'll be recovering at some point, and we'll kind of like try to reschedule the session. But that being aside, I have just come in to very, very warmly welcome uh, Dr. Aniket Alam uh, from the IIIT and to sort of like basically uh, the reason why Aniket, we're very, very keen that you should come for this session is because what we felt when we heard all of us heard you in the research methodology session that we need to hear you before people settle their topics, not so much after they settle their topics, because you, the various potential of uh, technology and the manner in which a lot of quantitative data can be qualitatively examined is something which came in very strongly for many of us who heard you in that session. And because this is like we've titled it Flying Research Guides, and we're trying to kind of provide some level of ideational support to various people who are wanting to register for their PhDs to do a doctoral work and otherwise to say that don't stay stuck with the same methodologies and the same topics. Technology and has opened up whole new avenues for you, which you did not even realize that they exist. And the thing somewhere is that especially as law people, we may have learned the nuts and bolts kind of technology. We don't really know what else is available in the market, which can make it possible for us to do a very intensive qualitative work for the sort of wide volume uh, of uh, decision making and other things which happen in law, be it in legislations, be it in judicial decisions. So it's for that reason that uh, we are especially excited to have you with us today. And I'm hoping even if one student gets excited enough and decides to do his or her doctorate in this field, I would feel it would have been worth it for us to push them in their direction. So I join Manisha and all other colleagues uh, to very warmly welcome you to the session of uh, flying research guides. And I hand it over to you. Also, I would sort of, I wanted to tell you that the procedure that we've been following is that questions that students have or candidates or people who've come joined here have had they will put them into the chat box. And Manisha will be moderating the session, so she will cluster them in a manner so that you know then they can be put together and you can answer a whole stream of questions together. We find that it becomes like very distracting if you're reading the questions and you're processing it and you're responding it. So she would help you in that process. And uh, I am just very excited to have you here. So welcome, Aniket, your show from here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Danda, for this uh, really warm and uh, fulsome introduction. Because this is exactly um, I have been flying research kites uh, since I joined Triple IT five years ago. Because uh, I had a sense of what was happening with technology, with some of the things that economists had been doing, some sociologists and political scientists. But it's only here that I realized that, uh, in fact. Um, as one of the papers in the main computer science conference called the ACM, it's the oldest conference uh, association of computer science. It's called ACM stands for, I think, uh, Association for Computing Machinery. It's like comes from the 1940s. It's the biggest global professional association of computer science professionals. Uh, they had a paper which basically said that computer science is basically social sciences. Um, Anything that computer scientists do is social sciences. And I realized that what a lot of social scientists do, we are in any case using a lot of computer science and uh, not really aware of what all can be done. And I think it's really important that this conversation happens. Uh, despite uh, uh, this being my second time that I'm speaking on this, uh, I don't think I, uh, you know, I am myself, uh, uh, an autodidact. I'm a no sikhia as in somebody who's learned it new and, you know, I'm still uh, learning the ropes as it were. Um, but given institutional requirements, given how we work, I have, have also had to um, 
supervised students who are computer science students who did uh, master's research thesis, which are in our system like MPhils um, uh, on various social science humanities topics, but they were computer science students using computer science tools. So I really had to learn on the job and uh, not come across as a total fool in front of my students. Um, and this has been a, a period of really intense learning for me. And I think it is important that I share some of it with the wider social science community, which includes people who are sort of not just studying law, but any aspect of society outside of computer science. And I think uh, it is, it is uh, this conversation which is really, really happening. I mean, if you look at what is happening with, uh, say, big tech, with the questions of privacy, um, with the questions of uh, what our data is being used for, is it safe, um, uh, how much can we depend on software and programs to take decisions for ourselves. Um, and increasingly, we allow it to take decisions for ourselves um, without thinking through these things, uh, whether it is driving or whether it's uh, communicating with people or listening to music or reading the news, et cetera, et cetera, cooking, uh, all of this is uh, eventually, uh, you know, getting basically mediated through digital various forms of computational technologies. So what I'm going to do is um, I have a PowerPoint which has, uh, unfortunately, I was trying to keep it within 30 slides so that uh, it's about an hour long, but the slides are now more than 50, but a lot of them I don't need to spend too much of time on. So hopefully I'll still keep it within an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I will talk about some of the issues that uh, technology, computer technology is bringing to the social sciences. Um, give examples from the work some of my students have done, uh, a sort of brief glimpse into their thesis that they submitted. And uh, mind you, all of these theses, our requirements here is um, for the master's thesis, all of them need two uh, publications in international platforms. It could be conferences, it could be journals, um, but it has to be uh, internationally recognized uh, platforms, uh, publication platforms. So all of them have gone through that. So uh, these have been sort of uh, accepted um, uh, internationally in some way that this is part of the larger debate on computational social sciences. We like to call it human sciences, it's humanities, social sciences, and I have never really understood the distinction between humanities and social sciences. There's natural sciences and there's human sciences. So um, with that uh, brief uh, preface, uh, I would like to now. My title is a little different from what uh, was given by Nalsar, but I think the, the, the object of uh, this talk would be still the same. And while I'm presenting this talk, there's an all-star cast of my students who are given in alphabetical order here. I'm going to give you examples from the thesis of these six uh, students um, who have uh, uh, done research uh, with me over the last few years. Uh, but before we get to seeing their work, uh, I'd like to just talk a little, I mean, this is in some ways a repetition of what I spoke earlier also uh, in March, but I think there's a new set of people here. And uh, in any case, uh, these topics could do uh, with uh, a fair amount of repetition as of now. The question is about measurement and quantification. And it is not just about quantitative social sciences that we do this. Modern academics is based on measurement and quantification, which is at the core. You could actually say that the big um, mental break, the intellectual break that happened um, in the 
a medieval period with the coming of the renaissance with the coming of new ideas with the emergence of modernity etc etc is the fact that everything can be measured and quantified to some extent and it's not just about space and material objects and natural life and people it's also things which you can't really hold in your hand like time like ideas like values uh, which can also at some level be measured and quantified i love you a lot or um, 57% of my time goes in this you know you can do these measurements and quantifications of um, a hierarchizing uh, of a sense and it is based on this and the the uh, and you know love and all those things is just uh, general regular life but in academia everything that we do is in some ways based on this it allows us to find patterns trends identify processes and this is irrespective of the inductive or deductive so even if you are using a deductive methodology with a certain theory which leads you to try and go and test it out uh, it still is about measurements and quantification at its core uh, this is what allows us to propose ideas uh, propose theories um, argue out uh, historical patterns social patterns structures events which are open for public corroboration verification falsification across time and space so i might say something which is a corroboration of something which was done 5000 miles away 100 years ago but because there is this foundation of measurement and quantification at the bottom of it which allows us to do this technology computer technology is in some ways just this old wine in new bottles what it has done is that it has helped raise our powers of measurement and quantification exponentially the speed at which we can break down an object it could be an idea it could be a um, theory it could be space it could be a large number of things the speed with which we can break them down and then add up again basically the building blocks of analysis of any form of analysis has risen exponentially we already had moved to increase that speed through the use of statistics through the use of research protocols which allowed us to organize our facts our evidence our data our um, uh, you know our um, sort of uh, readings in a manner which could be easily categorized measured put in place so that everybody else can also access it today not just texts not the speech not just visuals of all forms everything is now it's possible it's well beyond what statistics even the most advanced statistics could do using regular calculators or abacus or other things this fact that everything now can actually be broken down into numbers the binary zero and one is what is this new bottle and some would then argue and increasingly i am perhaps myself persuaded that it's not just old wine in new bottles it is but it's actually something 
entirely new which is emerging. Now we keep talking about big data for example. Big data is not about how much of it is there. Of course that is big data but big data the definition between big data and large amounts of any other data say the census the census can be of 1.3 billion people that is not necessarily big data big data is where human efforts end you cannot humanly deal with that data within the time and other constraints that are there to make sense of it so even if you have 2000 people working together in a well organized structure in a large research room with the same levels of mathematical and statistical and other abilities you still not be able to deal with data unless you use computational tools that is where big data begins it's at the event horizon of human capabilities collaborative human capabilities of the largest sort that you can think of and what i was talking about is hypothetical it's really impossible to do that sort of thing i mean some of those things that human beings did led to massive massive achievements so for example the mapping of india through the trigonometric survey between 1802 and 1875 where people walked around with these massive iron chains and the theodolites through the length and breadth of india measuring things so mount everest was measured using trigonometrical um uh, theories from the banks of the ganges at patna and those measurements were then constantly sent to calcutta where a large bank of mathematicians would sit using certain formulas to find elevation distance etc etc and that's how india was mapped over 75 years through the trigonometrical survey so that is not big data that still humans are able to do that but what it did was the entire space of india was now mapped and it was what does mapping mean it was measured and quantified you could put numbers to it big data is where that thing ends it's a whole new big deal it raises fundamental questions now about theory and method in the social sciences and some of them i have listed here for example what happens to the inductive deductive uh, the quantitative qualitative you know these debates within the social sciences and humanities what is i mean common sense but of course there are definitions of common sense there are lots of academic arguments about common sense but despite that there is something called i am not talking of common sense general i am talking of academic common sense what you don't have to cite in your thesis common knowledge where does it come from what can we assume how do we when computers are doing this we don't know why i for example really don't know why the full screen wasn't being shown earlier and why it was being shown now and you can keep increasing the number of examples you don't really know why it happens why when you are typing a whatsapp message it suggests one word today and a different word 3 days later when you are having a similar conversation we don't know so how how do we find i mean do we know how we find things out where does the boundary between machine and human work when you are driving a car almost every car today from the cheapest one available most of the two wheelers now which are coming to the market are basically computers with a drive train even when they don't call themselves that the 
the thing in that is the microchip is deciding what's happening what are you doing how you are doing how much petrol how much this how is the brake supply to which wheel how much all that is being done by a computer where's the boundary between machine and human where's the boundary between machine and human when i'm speaking to all of you in one room while physically all over the place through the mediation of this machine and as i was talking about what is the event horizon of human cognition as we will see in some of the case studies here what is it that we can know and how do we know that we know so for example if i tell you um, this is a problem this is a mathematical problem and can you solve it and you say yes i can solve it and you solve it and you have 10 steps and i follow those 10 steps and at the end of it i say yes and not just me anybody across time and space can go through those steps and say yes this is correct so pythagoras must have may have done something a few millennia ago in a very different geography but today you can sit and verify that and in the 1850s somebody can measure mount everest using pythagoras theories of how we know something and send those measurements to calcutta where somebody can use statistical tools drawn from mathematics and come up with the height of mount everest which is off by only 2 feet according to satellite imagery but do we know now how things happen when artificial intelligence machine learning is taking decisions for us and we are following those decisions you know for example now all your cars all our cars are stopping much quicker much safer than what they were 20 years ago so if as lawyers you had put somebody in jail 20 years ago and that poor guy comes out today and drives a car you if he breaks it, it's completely different because it's stopping many meters ahead and that's not because i mean it's of course cars improvement but it's ai it's machine learning it knows how to do that we have changed it's changing the way we are doing we are living we are knowing and before i get on again to finally on to the uh, case studies and talk us through what is happening i want to talk about the question of metadata because it keeps coming up uh, as lawyers i'm sure a lot of you uh, lawyers legal scholars you would be or just citizens of india the question of metadata what exactly is metadata and you know the famous i don't know if you guys know uh, the former cia chief I, this was i think in 2012 uh he in a congress congressional hearing he had uh, talked about uh, i mean this is his exact quote uh, which was there all over the us media saying we kill people based on metadata so this was an assurance he was giving the us congress an assurance that the cia does not read your emails it does not read your text messages it does not read your whatsapp messages it does not read your twitter direct messages because he said that's too much of statistical noise there's too much of data noise if you read all the content what we need is metadata that's enough to pinpoint terrorists for us or what they call terrorists is that we kill people based on metadata we don't read your emails we don't need to read your emails and of course since then metadata is the big thing everyone wants to know what is metadata so why is why do some people think that whatsapp 
is dangerous or Facebook is dangerous or your Gmail is dangerous because they're collecting humongous amounts of metadata. So right now they know at what speed, using what network, through what nodes, using what program, who's part of this uh, thing. So they don't know what I'm talking about. They don't look at that because that's encrypted. But they know everything around it. What device has been used by everybody? What is the status of the battery? Uh, how much uh, power this program is using? Um, at what uh, sort of volume is the uh, speaker and the microphone, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Time, place, of course. Everything, all that is metadata, the context. But also for social scientists, metadata as a scholar, researcher, um, put it, in fact, uh, you, you can Google this quote and you will find an excellent uh, PowerPoint presentation by this lady. I'm forgetting her name. Uh, I'm really bad with names. Oh, no. But anyhow, you, you will find it. She calls it metadata is a love note to the future because, I mean, for example, as a historian, I understand it. Or if you read crime fiction, or if you, for example, uh, do uh, criminal law, I mean, Sherlock Holmes or Martin Beck or Feluda or whatever else, they don't, they don't know what had happened. They look at the metadata, things around the context, and they build a story from that. It's those clues where, what, that bit of cigarette, that bit of uh, mark on the mud outside the window, um, you know, the curtain kept like this, uh, the dog which did not bark. This is all metadata. And as for 150 years it has been shown, metadata is enough to convict a criminal. Even legally. Of course, you call it circumstantial evidence, but at one point, the circumstantial evidence becomes so strong that if your legal system and your police system works reasonably well, then you should be in a position to get a confession because you know who has done it. And even if you don't get the confession and it fails on a technicality, you know who's done it and what happened, why, when, where, how? Social scientists call it other things. They call it proxy indicators. Archaeologists call it material remains. Historians call it evidence. So do we know there was a climate change or was it war or uh, was it floods or was it migration or disease? What led to the end of the Indus Valley civilization? So the theories are based on metadata. What do we find there? The context. And much of social science research, even today, is proxy indicators. You, I mean, there's a whole theory which says that everything is representation. I'm not even going there, but even those which don't make that radical claim do say that we need evidence. So you want to know um, how many people there are who um, say, for example, um, you know, um, you, you want to know how many people there are, uh, how many children there are who are stunted. So of course you can go and do a medical examination of the whole population, or you could use what is called metadata or proxy indicators. You want to know the income, you want to know the social conditions, you want to know the political conditions, you use proxy indicators. The census itself asks all these proxy indicators. Do you live in a pakka house or a kacha house? Do you have a tap connection at home or not? It's not about whether you have a tap connection at home. That tap connection tells you a lot about social and economic and various other factors, which is basically metadata. 
And what computers help us do is both the content, but also the metadata. Analyze it in the form of big data. So you get immense amount of metadata. You can now actually access also the content. The CIA doesn't want to do it because they'll have to look at all the emails. That's huge amounts of computing power, takes a lot of time, even for computers. So metadata is enough for them. And I mean, he said other things too, this Michael Hayden, he said that, you know, they have a 50% success rate, which is as good as human intelligence. So even when they get it from their spies on the ground, 50% of the times they get the right guy, 50% of the times they get the wrong guy, which I suppose if you actually do a dispassionate sort of study of quotes, for example, would find similar percentages, right? When they are looking at circumstantial evidence or direct evidence. Anyhow, I mean, let's not digress there, but I'm saying that the role of metadata is important because we talk of metadata, but what is metadata? It is very closely tied to what social science humanities research does, is to look at the context, look at the clues which people leave behind of their work, of their activities, of their relationships. And what's going to happen is we are going to see what computer science, how it deals with some of these questions. So the first thing that I learned, and that's why I start with this, is how important ontology is to computer scientists when they are studying society, for anything for that matter. Because, you know, computers are really dumb. You have to tell them what to do. Everything that this computer is doing, everything the computers at your end are doing, whether it's the mobile phone, whether it's a laptop, whether it's a desktop, whether it's any other device you're using, these are all computers. What they're doing is they're being told what to do. If this, then that. If this, then there. This, you know, it's constant instructions. And they just blindly follow those instructions. But blindly, at one point, they're able to deal with so many instructions that they can actually see the light of. So when I asked, so everybody here, my students and all the time, they're talking all the time of ontology. And then I realized, of course, there's a philosophical aspect to ontology. And there is a computer science aspect to it, what is called formal sort of definitions. So how do you define a certain thing? For a computer, you have to define something. So how do you define a poem? How do you define sport? We know it implicitly. A philosopher might. And that's where, for example, with sports, with uh, poems, with curiosity, with anger, we came up against this wall. Because if you go to the humanities and social sciences, to the human sciences, you will find that there are definitions which, when you then try to break them down, they give you a sense of it, what it means, but you really can't identify it. What exactly is a sport? Where does sport end and game play begin? Or just horsing around with friends on a field? What is the point where sports ends and gameplay begins or is there a distinction between game and sport or they're just two words which mean the same thing like in you know Hindustani you have samay and vakt which mean the same thing or is there something different and how do you define that how do you define a poem how do you define what exactly is curiosity can you define it? Now, of course, philosophers have done it. 
some social scientists. So there's a whole uh, tradition, debate, discussion, rich one in literature and literary theory about what exactly is a poem. But since the middle of the 19th century, increasingly what you realize is the definition of a poem is fairly vague and it's embarrassingly vague at times because it's about how it elevates your moods, how it elevates your feelings. It would well be talking about cannabis. How it makes you think, see things in a different light. Yeah, I mean, that seems like illegal substance. How it's full of metaphors. So can be prose. What is poetic prose? Why is it called poetic prose and not a poem? What is a prose poem? How do you define the word poem? And then you realize that it's actually a lot of hard work as social scientists to define things precisely. And as I point out in, on this slide that as lawyers are good at this because definitions, what exactly is this is important, but Computational tools need to take it to another level. So when you see something, what is it? Is it this or is it not that? And much of computer science efforts, when you are building a model, when you are coding, I see with my students is in getting the ontology right because otherwise things will go wrong. Are you talking of dowry or are you talking of a gift? Now, of course, as you know, there are innumerable court cases on that. Is it a gift? Is it a dowry? Where does it, how do you decide? Is it just intuition? I mean, even if it is intuition, there's something behind it. Can that be identified? Or can we identify where intuition ends and a precise definition begins? Now, for example, let's continue with prose and poem. And now we get into these case studies, uh, which I'll show you from the research work of my students. Now, if you see, on your, on your uh, right is the poem, but you can actually also put it as prose and it reads fairly well. What how do you decide that it is a poem that is not a poem? Is it just line breaks? So you look at poems anecdotally and you find nowadays a majority of poems don't use meter, don't use rhyme. Uh, they don't follow the conventional characteristics of what a poem is. Um, Urdu Shairi still does mostly, but not entirely. But uh, in English, it's rare. In Hindi, too much less than in Urdu. But what is happening? Are poems actually dying out? To know that, we need to... So, for example, the student came to me saying, I want to make a poetry generator. She said, a person should be able to say 
oh, it's raining, there are dark clouds, I'm feeling gloomy, I'm remembering a pizza I had two days ago, um, I have to finish my assignment. And if I tell these things to the poetry generator, it should be able to generate a poem. So, okay, if you want to do that, you have to first define what is a poem that it will generate. So we started defining a poem and it took us one and a half years because you go back and you realize that definitions of poems starting from Eliot to Terry Eagleton to everybody else. I mean, she looked at some two dozen different authors and theorists. From the mid 19th century onwards, it's becoming increasingly vague. It's about your feelings, what it does to you, uh, something spiritual, etc., etc. Whereas before that, if you see, the definition of poem includes the meter, the rhyme, the rhythm, the type of metaphors that are allowed, what is allowed, what is not, there are different types of poems. So this poem will have to have this structure, that poem will have to have this structure. An ode is different from an elegy, from, um, you know, a sonnet is different uh, from a haiku, uh, a shade is different from a nazam, all those things, rules were there. But as poets experimented with form and content, often to great aesthetic value, the definition of a poem becomes increasingly imprecise. We don't know. So then we said, forget about the poetry generator, let's just define a poem and see what is happening to a poem. Let's do a biography of the poem. Is the poem merging into the prose? Because increasingly that seems so. And if it is, can this be computationally verified? So what we did was we called it the study of poetry in the age of mechanical reproduction with a hat tip to Benjamin uh, uh, Walter Benjamin and uh, we said we'll take two sets of texts. One when a majority of poems were still following the traditional form of poetry and the late stage, right? A hundred years apart, a 50 year gap between them. So 1870 to 1920, when much of the old definitions were working, but what was called at that time blank verse, non-rhyming poems were coming in. People were sort of playing around with meters, changing meters midway through the poem, etc., etc. It was also the time of an efflorescence of prose, novels, short stories, others. And then we said we look at it again from the 1970s to 2019, which is like 49 years, one year less, but our period, which is also the time when digital reproduction, not just mechanical, but digital reproduction of art happens, poetry, sound, everything else. And what, oh, I somehow, so what I should have put here, I think, is that what she did was she went and collected so many thousand, I think it was uh, 50,000 words worth, or maybe was it uh, 500,000 uh, words of prose. And yeah, I think it was 500,000 words of prose and 50,000 words of poetry, because of course poems are much smaller from both these stages, the early stage and the later stage. 500,000 words, 5 lakh words of prose and 50,000 words of poetry. Uh, we collected that and then we started thinking about what can we use to define a poem. So nowadays poems are defined largely by these two things semantic features, the imagery, the metaphors, the sentiments, the themes, topics, associations, line breaks. It's surprising how much uh, of 
a definitional load line breaks carry for a poem today it's difficult to do that because you know depending on what is the form of the prose that will also have line breaks and that we read as poem but what could we use we could use grammar because the whole idea of poetic license was to break free from the limitations of grammar to keep within the limitations of meter and rhyme and rhythm and the structure so a sonnet has to have a certain structure so you are allowed to take license of grammar but not of that structure it is basically the meter and the rhyme and how do you do that so we looked at a whole bunch of and this was partly manual but partly also computational to look at the different types of poetic license the breaking of grammar so you have the adjective inversion the sub subject verb inversion the prepositional phrase inversion or some my soon found somebody had called the yoda constructions the dependent clause the question the beginning with a conjunction all those things and i said okay these are the things there are certain in classical definition certain meters rhymes structures that a poem needs to follow and those are classic classic in the sense of running over millennia you have poetry being written 2000 years before christ before our common era that's over 4000 years of a tradition which continues so let's take that and we then collected texts from good reads for prose and poem hunter and poetry foundation from poetry um she got this classification model which is machine learning which basically trained the text on these features so we found what are these features we defined the different meters you know the pentameter the trimeter the um i have forgotten what all these different meters i am not a literature person but we went by whatever the textbook definitions were and the models were trained sometimes the data was annotated so the models saw that this was a poem because it met all these features and it had these types of inversions in it or these types of poetic license and so it could once it started training we told it the features it looked at text and it said yeah this text fits with the iambic pentameter and this form of a poem this text does not meet anything else thus it would be prose and over some time by annotating that data we came up with this thing that a certain numerical value if it meets some of these features up to a certain level which you could give a numerical value to then it is a poem else it is prose and so these models are able to distinguish a poem from a prose based on the given features and so what she found was the gap between prose and poem so prose too especially literary prose flowery literary prose often takes poetic license their short sentences short paragraphs their questions their turns of phrases various things happen so literary prose and one of the things we wanted to do we did a bit but given that it was a master's thesis we and we were running short of time we had to let that go we said we'll also so for example at academic prose and typically the score there was coming around 2 literary prose was coming around 5 and academic prose was coming around 
and poetry was coming around 10. But what we find by the late 20th century, from the late 19th century, is that the gap between prose, literary prose, which basically has the same score, but the score for poetry is going down. So the gap is narrowed. And according to my student, if this continues, then in the next two, two decades, it will be impossible to identify a piece of poetry from a piece of prose it will be self-classified. So I can write something and say, oh, this is a poem. And unless I call it a poem, I brand it a poem, you will not be able to look at it and say it's a poem. It's like you can look at a sheep and say, oh, that's a sheep. And you can look at this table and say, oh, it's a table and it's not a bed. Or you can look and say that, oh, that's a stool and that's not a footrest or anything. Or oh, that's a car and that's not a truck, even though they have four wheels and an engine. And that's a bird and that's a plane. Now that possibility of an independent assessment, ontology, was vanishing for poems. It was merging, as it were, into uh, prose. So she looked at all of this, you know, the rhyming scheme, uh, and of course, you find that in the 1970 to 2019 period, a third of them have none of them. And same with the meter. You find that some of these meters are still being used, but mostly none. So there's this shift to simple meters, if at all, or none. And it's really stark. It's really stark that poems are slowly merging into prose. And if you actually look at the history of literary creations, it's really fascinating because poetry is how literature was done for thousands of years. Nobody wrote prose, nobody wrote novels till the coming of the modern age. A novel is an extremely new creation. And it emerges and it's soon eating up poetry, which has been there for thousands of years. And poetry is slowly merging into prose. Similarly, we looked at, tried to do a formal ontology of sport. Can we build a formal ontology where you can irrespective of what people call it, you can say this is sport. Because of the definitional characteristics. So how do you go about it? So you have to break up sports. So we said, okay, let's look at a whole bunch of different types of sports. So we have to make a sort of a set of diff what are the different types of sports. Then break it down into what is the smallest unit on which, so the term we came up with was serializable factor. So you have a series of events which lead up from the beginning to the end, to the conclusion, which is in every sport. So for example, let's say, say cricket, the bowler takes the ball, runs down, delivers the ball, it comes to the batsman, there are a whole range of possibilities that happen. Even when the bowler is taking the ball and running down, there's a range of possibilities, what happens where. And there's only one set of possibilities which lead to certain types of results. Similarly, with any sport, shot put or badminton or you name it, swimming or hurdles or anything, Batman, computer sports, other sports. So, a lot of mathematics involved, which frankly I don't follow too much. My student was doing this. I was asking some of my colleagues about it. And what we did was we listed a bunch of sports, different types, individual, group, um, uh, 
what are the things that are being tested there and he said let's use them and see what are the categories that build go to build that ontology the the, the events which create serializable factors the rules the entire rules for the game but also for each of the events within the game so say you're looking at volleyball for example so you take the ball and uh, you hit it on the other side of the net so that's an event so what are the rules for that but there are certain game rules where do you get the points from and how do the points add up and what is the termination point of the game or also of the event where does the event end and the next event begins and together where does the game begin and where does the game end and if you can do that then perhaps you could come towards building an ontology of sports which anybody whether a computer program or a human being or anything can look and say oh this is sport and that is not sport and my secret wish at that time was that this should lead us to saying that ipl is not sport it's just gambling but yeah we didn't reach there we didn't even look at cricket so but yeah i mean uh, i i i at one moment when we were doing the serializable factor like this right so you break it down into every measurable unit so when we are doing this we actually thought that the commute from home to office and office to home especially in places like bombay for example could actually be like a serializable factor you leave home at a certain time you have to be there at a certain time on the platform look position yourself properly for the door get in any of those moments you don't foul you're out of the game and if things are really bad you're on the track but if each of those work you end up exactly on the time in your office so maybe if we have this definition it's a form of sport which is why there's so much of nostalgia and literary production over it perhaps i we didn't again go there but these are the type of ideas that are coming so you know once you start doing this oops sorry uh, i think there was a slide missing shotput what are the event rules what are the game rules right we looked at this we put it down like this and then we made a graphical representation so the athlete enters the circle with the shot there are three possibilities she doesn't pause it's a foul pauses longer than a minute it's again a foul but if you don't pauses only for between a second and 59 seconds or 60 seconds then it's a correct shot and then if the athlete leaves the circle before the shot lands it's a foul if the shot lands outside the boundaries of the sector it's a foul drops below the shoulder it's a foul but if it lands within the sector you update the score so these are the termination points five termination points which are fouls one where the score is updated and this is you know this is my event horizon of where i stop comprehending what is happening i am not really good with mathematics and mathematical logic but what she did was to make a graphical representation of the shot put so you then start comparing say hurdles with shot put different types of games but ontologically you could now start comparing you could start comparing badminton with bowling because you had broken them down into their 
events, into what the game is composed of, into serializable factors, into the formal rules. And now you could say that different types of sports have different types of serializable factors and how they are done. So you have, so we said for the moment, let's keep aesthetic sports out, like say, um, you know, uh, there are some of them like, uh, what are the, there's this, uh, you know, you, uh, you swim in a manner, a lot of people swim together. It's one of those Olympic sports where the point is only about how beautifully you swim uh, in groups. I've forgotten what it's called. Um, but we, we said we look at what are called purposive sports, which is an overwhelming majority of what those sports are. And within purposive sports, you have measurement of time and space as one of the ways in which it works. So it's measurement of time, measurement of space. Sometimes you have both. Then you have the point system, the win condition, the lose condition, win plus lose condition, or you have panel of judges like with athletics or uh, boxing or And this is how we then said we can build an understanding of sports. Now, unfortunately, a master's thesis can go only that much. But eventually, we are confident that if she herself or somebody else picks up this, we can actually work towards an ontology of sports. Coming to curiosity. So how do you identify curiosity? So there are various theories of curiosity. So you look at how people have theorized curiosity. And I won't go into the details. There is diverse curiosity. There is headlines as an object of measure, the information gap, uh, emphatic curiosity, etc., etc. And we focused on information gap and epiphany. There's an information gap. You don't know something and somebody says, oh, you know, why turtles come to the beach in Orissa every year? There's an information gap and you are told something. There's a sense of epiphany. And we said, this is what works with clickbait. Clickbait works on a perceived information gap that you have and the sense of pleasure that that closure of that information gap gives you. And typically it is things which are just there. It's, it's a question of pleasure. It's not about, um, it's not about, but it's not purposive necessarily. It sometimes could be, but definitionally it need not be. And this came not from a computational study. It came from looking at psychologists and philosophers who had worked on curiosity. And then he said, if this is so, then let's look at clickbait. And clickbait is something which can now be done computationally. So what we did was we went, used a scraper to get headlines from three newspapers. I won't give the names of the newspapers. You can decide which are these. There was one serious newspaper, which we decided. One newspaper, and they're all similar. There were the, the tabloidish newspaper is not a tabloid. It's a proper newspaper. The serious newspaper as it positions itself is a proper newspaper and there's an anti-establishment newspaper that calls itself an anti-establishment newspaper. And we took headlines from them on the same events. And then we looked at how many times people were clicking those headlines. 
most of them the the websites the newspapers themselves were not giving us this data so we got some proxy indicators including how much it was shared on twitter how much it was shared on facebook which gives us a sense of how click how many clicks were coming to it how many people were looking at it and how many people were finding this information gap and epiphany there so they saying oh i didn't know this this is interesting others should know this it's going to fill the information gap for others that's why you want to share often not always but that's typically with so what are the headlines how many times people are clicking on them sometimes google gave us some information sometimes uh they had you know viewed so many times etc etc information on the website so we collected all of that computationally we sort of not when go and pick it up by pen and paper but get the data even if it is not shown there but collected and available we took all of that and then we analyzed it for content structure the style of it the emotions in it using what are called natural language processing tools and then we said a complementary emotion to curiosity is anger so a lot of what happens on twitter and facebook on social media on the reading of news is either curiosity which is clickbait you will never imagine what happened to you know put the name of your favorite celebrity there and similarly questions of outrage so you go and read newspapers you go and look up news stories when there's outrage i mean the whole uh television media today i mean when we were doing this in 2017 it wasn't i mean it was still pretty bad but today for example it's even worse i mean the whole television media is based on outrage they are based on throwing chili powder in your eyes every night in the news that supposed news that comes and everybody is not competing with that they are competing for your eyeballs they who can throw more chili powder and even though your eyes are full of chili powder and they're burning how can somebody outrage you even more so we said we look at two different events the horrific rape murder of jyoti singh and the cold blooded contract style killing equally horrific of the journalist gauri lankesh uh, across uh, times one happened uh, in 2012 the other happened just when she was collecting my student was collecting her data and analyzing it it had just so it was right there when we were working on it um when jyoti singh happened twitter was still a very marginal social media it was mainly facebook where people were venting where people were organizing protests where people were sharing stuff where people were discussing talking and gauri lankesh was by then of course facebook was there but twitter had become very big and there was a lot of outrage on twitter also the type of people who did uh, get involved in both these were slightly different so we said it will give us some sense and okay just a aside while i'm talking of this my student was also reading up on habermas my student was also reading up of charles taylor my student was also reading up on the theories of public sphere on the theories of political action on political theory while also doing this so the whole idea was to try and not just do computational stuff but based it on political theory on the understanding the best understanding that social sciences and humanities brings so for nirbhaya we looked at uh, facebook mainly 40 groups which are talking about it activist groups discussion groups newspaper groups etc etc we looked at close to 7500 posts each some of those posts were really long because facebook allows you to write long texts we looked at more than 100000 tweets 
from about 40, 43,000 handles and 11,000, close to 12,000 hashtags. And we build up these worlds, the virtual communities, the sentiment analysis, the emotions that were there, what was triggering outrage, right? How was outrage peaking? What happens when outrage subsides, et cetera, et cetera. And what we found, for example, on computing anger, on Gauri Lankesh, we found uh, so neutral words, of course, will be massive, right? Because neutral words are all the prepositions and regular words here and there. Yes. But if you see the negative words, so Facebook allows you to use far more words. So the number of negative words is far higher as a proportion. And if you see Twitter, because you have to keep yourself short, it's one or two strong adjectives, one or two strong nouns that are used. But as you can see in both cases, positive words were far lower than negative words. And see the word cloud that comes up from what are the maximum words that are being used. And you can see, again, what is happening. So word clouds work typically by looking at the whole corpus. So for example, on Jyoti Singh, it looked at, uh, when I have talked about here, um, these 7,500 posts, um, together close to 200,000 words. It picked up the words with the strongest sentiments. And similarly with Gauri Lankesh, from those tweets, it picked up the words with the strongest sentiments. And if you see how outrage builds up, what we found here and what was seen in the publications and the conference proceedings, uh, presentations that we made, uh, was something which was new, this, that something very significant about social media outrage is peaks very quickly and also falls very quickly. There's a sharp peak and whether it's states or social entities, if they can ride out that peak of outrage, when it is really sharp, it collapses very quickly. It does not sustain. Unlike non-social media outrage which builds on the street or builds through what are non-digital forms of political mobilization. And the same with Gauri Lankesh. And here also you can see, I don't know, I mean, it's very small. I should have used a larger font, but you can see December 20th uh, at the uh, extreme uh, left and December 31st by the extreme right. It's just those uh, 20, uh, sorry, 10, 11 days that we looked at. And same with Gauri Lankesh, it's practically gone in 10 days. So this helps us build an idea of how outrage works. I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time. Is that okay? Uh, I'll take another 20 minutes. Um, maybe 10 minutes, Aniki, so that there's enough time okay. for discussion. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've spoken about big data earlier. I won't repeat it. This point comes again at another point. I keep repeating myself because this is important to know that uh, it deals with quantities of data which are humanly impossible. There are millions of data points and to use them together, to analyze them together is difficult for him, impossible for human beings, but now is becoming increasingly common for the most simple of computer uh, tools that we have. And this is leading to, so for example, I wanted to put this, because this is not computational stuff, but this was done by a student of mine. In fact, um, he also had, I think, gone and uh, 
made a presentation at Nalsar or he had spoken to somebody there. Uh, I have forgotten. He spoke to lawyers in Bombay and Delhi and other places. And the question was about results from AI which cannot be explained. So the algorithms self-train. So for example, we trained the algorithm to look at poetry and prose and it gave us a result. Now that was relatively small by data standards and we knew how it was happening, but when it's massive, when you're looking at tens and hundreds of millions of data points over time and space, it is impossible to see why this was done, how the results were calculated. So insurance claims, classic case where some of you, if you're practicing lawyers, looking at insurance and other financial issues, people just don't know why some people get higher premiums, some get low when they are calculated. Chatbots, how are they taking decisions on what to say, what not to say? Some of the simple ones, we know, we keep very strict parameters, but the expensive ones, we don't know. We have had examples where two chatbots are talking to each other and within less than a day, they have developed a new language. Nobody knows what they're saying. Human beings don't know what they're saying. Maths proof, for example, or what I had spoken about in Nalsar earlier, AlphaGo Zero, which was trained to play the game Go. And it basically came up with its own strategies of playing, which no human knew. And AlphaGo was trained on tens of thousands, in fact, I think more than a million human games, which people had played earlier and kept records of. So it learned itself on that over months. But AlphaGo Zero, the next level, was basically not trained with any of the data or strategy that humans played. It was just given the rules, like we gave uh, the model for poetry. It was given the rules, but there we annotated, kept annotating. Here it was just given the rules and it kept playing itself. And it worked winning strategies out. And when it was playing a human being, there's this famous move 37, which was inexplicable. And everyone thought AlphaGo Zero, doesn't, it doesn't make sense, it's going to lose. But that move 37 later was found to be crucial in it winning the game. And nobody still knows how it came to that, what is the thought process behind it, and will it ever be replicated, even in the same scenario? It's impossible. We don't know how to, it's autonomous decision making. And that brings up legal issues. How does society deal with decisions? which she doesn't understand. How were they taken? Are they correct or not? Now you have software which writes software. Software which produces things. Software which is taking decisions. But who owns that? Who's responsible for it legally? And there is no legal consensus. Of course, there is the GDPR, right? the right to explanation, which is holding up a lot of things, including robotic surgery, because you really don't know why the robot takes a decision to make an incision at one play point and not the other, and why it does this or that, etc., etc. And where does human responsibility end? And I'll quickly go through two other things about empowering citizens and quickly end there. We know that big corporations, states use these tools to control citizens, right? There's this whole thing about uh, elections being stolen by Facebook, today the government of India is after Twitter, um, there's a whole question about all our data with through Alexa and Siri and uh, Google Home with their servers, they know more about us, the CIA kills on metadata, et cetera, et cetera. So we know all of this. People are constantly talking about the digital panopticon of how everything is mapped out. So Amazon and Google know what I'm about to do, when I'm about to do, what I'm typically going to do. And these things 
in a sense are building a digital prison for us so can citizens reverse the gaze can these tools that are being used to control citizens be used to look at opaque bodies like the state like corporations like political parties which are so big and so powerful at some levels that we find it difficult to know enough about it what is happening what is the state doing what is the corporation doing and can we use metadata to reverse this digital gaze so one of my students said we are going to use only available it tools we are not going to break any laws we are not going to hack into systems to get data which is secret we are just going to use publicly available data and use the tools of social network analysis to find something so first we started thinking of amazon then we looked at coca cola then we said okay let's look at a political party then we looked at a few political parties we started with the cpm and i think the samajwadi party not good enough not enough of a digital presence not all india enough the only other all india thing was the um, congress but again not well organized so we finally ended up with the rashtra swayam sevak sang and what is called the sang parivar the, uh, the family of organizations which owe allegiance or some sort of an ideological affiliation to the rashtra swayam sevak sang and we say can we get a sense of what is happening reverse the digital gaze using what is called metadata to build a social network analysis and see what is happening within the rashtra swayam sevak sang universe so these were the limitations we set for ourselves only legitimate publicly available data use only freely available tools because this whole idea was to strand see can citizens reverse the gaze so of course we are not going in for very expensive specialized software which you need money as well as skill training for no interviews or personal interactions minimal use of secondary literature just to see just by metadata can we build something so what we did was we collect information about all the organizations which formed the sang parivar we came up with a list which was like in the 120s but then what we did sec minimal use of secondary literature we went to a very classic book uh by walter anderson and shridhar damle uh which lists 36 organizations then from that we pared it down by looking at two other books i'm forgetting of and the names of those but we looked at them and we pared it down to i think 8 or 10 or maybe 12 organizations uh which we said are the most important organizations we'll look at we'll identify the principal actors in each organization so the organizations are identified in the principal actors who's the head who are the president uh, general secretary treasurer etc etc then use google news archives of google news the only thing we did was we built a web scraper which will look at the urls and automatically keep collecting stories with the keywords of all the organization and the principal actors so we looked at the organization we went to their website took down all the names of the principal actors for the last 3 years um and then used those as keywords to get all the news and information about these principal actors and organizations and then map them make a network map who's connecting to whom at what nodes of all these organizations and individual actors and the trajectory so somebody is meeting here then they're meeting there they're moving there etc etc so they you build a map and you try to see clusters around topics around time or geographical area etc etc so i won't go into the details again but to tell you what eventually the interesting thing that came out which was considered significant by the research community was the fact that this 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 was what we looked at and we found 
that the RSS and the BJP, of course, I mean, that doesn't need this representation to show, are the two biggest nodes within the Sangh Parivar, but followed by the VHP and the APP, which are significantly smaller, as you can see. But what is interesting, what we found was the RSS remains the organization with the maximum links. It has links to every other organization within what is called the Sangh Parivar. Like the, all the organizations which owe some sort of organizational or ideological affiliation to the RSS. Of course, it has links with all of them. But the density of linkages, though with fewer organizations, almost half of what the RSS has, the density of linkages has shifted to the BJP. So at, in one metric, the RSS remains the center of the Sangh Parivar. By another metric, the BJP has moved to the center as this shows. And the RSS is slowly moving to the site. And this data was collected after the 2014 elections. He said the next interesting research would be to look at 2004 to 2014 and then go back all the way to 1980 when the BJP was formed and maybe look at it from the time of independence. It would be really interesting, but for that, you would need to also digitize news, do various other things, um, digitize all the publicly available data on that. But it can be done, and why just RSS? It can be done on any political party. It can be done on any corporation. It can be done on any state organization. It can be done on how does a court work? So you can take up one of the courts of a high court, for example, and map out all the judges, all the lawyers, all the law officers, all the other staff, all the petitions, where the petitioners are coming from, and a network map which will show you what that high court is doing. Similarly worked on the religious history of Spiti. I'll run through this quickly to just tell you how geographical information we are using to look at this place. It borders Tibet and Ladakh. It is this part of India up here. This is Spiti, this area, uh, cold desert, um, very uh, difficult to access, it's beyond the Himalayas, it's a trans-Himalayan area, um, it's sparsely populated, huge area, but sparsely populated, barely about 12,000 people live there, but they live under one of the five monasteries. Religion is really strong, the monastic system is very strong. So what we did was we collected data from questionnaires, in-person interviews, observations, but also marked out the religious places in Spiti using GPS devices. And one of the things we looked at were the Chortans. Those are the small stupa-like things we'll see all over uh, the Himalayas, the Tibetan-influenced Himalayas. These are basically sacred structures, which one particular type, the eight types, one particular type uh, is meant to protect the village from evil forces. So typically any habitation would have these Chortans on four sides, at least three sides, but typically on four sides to protect uh, the village from evil forces. They look like this, various places. Some are old and not well maintained. Some are very new. Some are interesting because this Chorten has become big and the area around it has been cut down to make roads, but this on a piece of rock continues. Earlier it was apparently all, you know, you could just Walk there. Now you have to walk up through a staircase on the side, very elaborate. The other Chortans, you can see this, one of the village Chortans outside the agricultural area to protect all the agricultural fields. There are others which were put in place like this one, which was put in place to commemorate victory over an illness and it keeps illness out of the village. So we mapped all of them, right? We map them according to 
the monastery, the sect, the number of villagers there, the number of sites that uh, we mapped uh, according to different, uh, in different villages, you had different number of chortons. So total of close to 300 chortons we mapped. We used an open source uh, GIS system called QGIS, which you, you know, it's easily available. It's free to download, the free tutorials to tell you how to work, how to input geographical data, etc., etc. And this is how it comes out. So for example, this in Gwe village, uh, we found these tortons. This is the village. You can see the houses. You can see the agricultural area. You can see the river flowing down here. Right? Uh, there's another village called Chichum. This map isn't that clear, but you find, again, these are the chortons which protect the village. This is the habitation. These are all the agricultural areas here. This is Demul. This is, again, the chortons which are there. This is another village, Komik, which is apparently the highest village um, in the world, I think, or at least in Asia, some 15,500 feet above sea level. Um, again, the Chortons, you can see here, you can see agricultural fields here, you can see some of the houses, right? And then we use that, we cleaned up the map, we lighted it up, we made it proper, and then we did this and we found that increasingly, people are moving agriculture outside of these Chortons and often habitations outside of this chart. So they have a new house coming up here. There's a road for their house coming up here. Um, again, here you see a whole set of agriculture which has happened outside, right? Uh, with uh, little houses coming up in their agricultural area. And these are the traditional chartons. Komik, for example, it's just this much and there is huge, I mean, well, this is a monastery, but these other houses which have come up here are outside these areas and agricultural fields coming out. And this helped us argue out the project. I'm still writing the report out, but this helped us argue out the secularization in Spiti, that agricultural fields and habitations are moving beyond the religious boundaries of the Chortons. Chortons are now becoming more spectacle and less functional and how this is a, one of the ways in which one can look at the breakdown of the older community forms embedded, embedded in a certain theophany and the replacement with, I mean, just for a short bullet point here, I've said modernity, modernization, it's a more argued nuanced point, but this, and there are various other research agendas whether you want to use, say, studying Tauri, you get the database of all court documents from high courts and Supreme Courts, you use social network analysis, GIS, sentiment analysis to identify trends, predict events. You can very easily, just like the CIA uses metadata to say, okay, there's going to be a terrorist who's going to travel from Helmand to so-and-so place and you'll send a drone. You can actually predict that given these conditions, from what we have seen, it is highly likely that there's a dowry problem there. Uh, you can look at Constitutions compare structures, if then trends, if certain features are there in a constitution, does it lead to certain consequences or not? If you look at all the constitutions across time and space over the last 150 years or 200 years, correlate that with political, social, economic factors. One of my students actually did that, looking at preambles and looking at seeing there are different types of preambles and doing a computational study of preambles and correlating that with political, social, and economic factors and seeing what happens where. Media, for example, you know, the bias and perspective, reach and effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, I've taken almost uh, 25 minutes, uh, 20 minutes more than I had planned to. But in conclusion, I would like to say that what computers have done now is akin to what happened with the coming of the printing press, with the coming of electricity. Computer technologies are changing the very foundations of our society, the ways in which we study society of knowledge as a category, what printing press did, what the coming of electricity did. And today the specific thing of this is, so for example, the printing press 
secularize the script. The script wasn't scripture anymore. It wasn't the gift of God. It was profane. Anybody could use the script to do anything. Electricity, you know, lighted up the world in a manner where you could see things in a completely different light. Humans could see in a manner which no other species or even humans earlier could not see. And that itself changed the way we study society, knowledge as a category. And the power it gave us to our machines and other things. And what computers have done, building out printing technology, building on electricity, is in a sense to efface perhaps the borders, the ontological boundary between the machine and the human. So while we might have science fiction things about robots and AI and there was this film right about this uh, woman who's actually an AI and this man falls in love with her or something. I haven't seen it but a friend of mine was telling me and I was telling them about this. So, but it is already happening. It is already happening. Uh, it's not just Tinder and Facebook, but even regular messaging that we do and everything is mediated through the machine by the form, by what the machine does, how it makes us express ourselves. So we are already inside the machine as it were. The machine is inside us. Uh, the distinction between us being inside the machine and the machine being inside us is also slowly becoming fuzzy. And it's a new territory. Can we learn to read this map? And if we don't learn to read this map, will we be able to survive? And which is why I think if you have to do social sciences, any form of research, you have to be self-conscious of the machine. Sorry, I've taken a little longer, but uh, I'm done. Thank you, Aniket. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. And thank you for all those amazing examples. Because as we saw the examples that you've done, I think all of us started to feel, okay, what are the kinds of, uh, you know, huge um, environs, even if we just knew the reality, because I think what was very, at least I found very liberating was that one doesn't have to go and sit there and try to cull out the, the, the micro kind of data, the metadata gives you a huge opportunity to be able to make analyses, which we didn't even know exists. And for us, whether it's in the court system or in the legislative system or in just how people activate courts, you know, what is the, the whole entire people's interaction with the law opens up an entire range of avenues of being able to do research. I mean, that was a feeling I had got when I had heard you, uh, you know, like, in April, but this is like, I think, way richer in terms of because it's more concrete, one knows exactly what you are speaking out there, I think. So thank you very, very much. Uh, generally, the trend we follow before I hand over to uh, Manisha is we give everybody about five, seven minutes of reflection time, about a little small break to the speaker also. You can go have yeah. a you know, glass of water, have a cup of yeah, tea. I'll get a quick cup of tea for myself. Yes, yes. So that they, you know, it's like a very, very new material that they are listening to. So give them some reflection time before we just say, go ask questions, because you get a lot more, I would say, you know, like top of the head questions when you don't give reflection time. So sure. we we'll give this about seven to eight minutes for them to think sure, it. Sure. You have your cup of tea and then we'll yeah. start again. Sure. And Manisha will be taking over from here. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just uh, close my video for about 5-10 minutes. Yes, I'll, I'll give you a call when you start. Please do that. Yeah. Please do that. Okay. No, we have to be kind. Yeah, somebody is speaking for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Some level of... <laughs> so yeah. for the rest, this is what you just... Please sit and think first, mm -hmm. then pen down the questions because everybody will get an opportunity to ask your questions. So we are not in any which way going to hassle you. But we do want that those questions are like good, relevant questions. And it's because nobody's trying to impress the other. It's just somebody, all of us wanting to learn from each other. Okay. Yeah. So Manisha, I'm handing over to you. Yeah. So thank you so much, Aniket. I was just, when you talk about ontology of poem, etc., I was just thinking if one could 
do ontology of different kinds of things, you know, different kinds of legal categories and, okay. you know, ontology of sedition, for example. Okay. That would be something quite interesting to do. Um, and also kind of long-term patterns and, you know, trends one could identify through these methods. But I think one of the things that, that would be a kind of a problem uh, in doing this kind of research would be the things need to be digitized first, right? Because in, in, in you know, all the many district courts and lower courts are now going online, but there's still a great paucity of, uh, you know, digitization in the lower courts, for example. So that, that just might be a little bit of a, uh, a problem till we can actually do. Right. Yeah, so let's open the floor for everybody else. Uh, please type in your questions. Yeah, that, that's one thing which um, I think which a lot of us would have in mind, which is that, you know, people like us who come from humanities and social science backgrounds who do not, I mean, like I run away from mathematics and computer science, right? So, I mean, how can some of us who are not so, you know, conversant with right. these kind of methods, is there a way of um, negotiating? And yeah, so um, Actually, uh, in fact, I should also perhaps uh, share with you two of the sources which I tell others. See, number one, a lot of these things can be done um, by uh, tools which are pretty intuitive and uh, they are freely available, uh, freely in the sense that you might have to pay a little, but say Excel sheets and, you know, um, uh, the Excel sheet thing. So you don't have to go into the complicated aspects of Excel, Excel sheets, but Excel sheets are, so everyone calls of database and all that. So Excel sheets are database and a lot of the material that you get, you can actually just download as Excel sheets and then do a lot of pretty interesting analysis just on Excel sheets. And Excel sheets is maybe just a tad more difficult than learning Microsoft Word or PowerPoint. Um, uh, you could uh, use for example, word clouds or simple what are called natural language processing tools like sentiment analysis, polarization, um, there's these other things, uh, topic modeling, uh, word tree, uh, word clouds. These are very simple. You get off the shelf tools available, um, often free uh, open software tools, which you can start using. Um, but if you are able to, it is a lot of computing is now not necessarily very difficult mathematical stuff. You could actually think in terms of using and uh, what I would do, in fact, maybe I can share these two uh, things. Um, just give me a minute. Oops, where did I go wrong? Something happened. Yeah, oh, I do share it here. Right, my entire screen. So yeah, you can see my screen, right? I hope you can see my screen. No, we can only see you. Okay, now? Mm, yeah. But it's like tiny. Oh, okay, hold on. Can you see this? Better. Uh, can you see this? Yes. Website? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are four historians who got together and said, can we do uh, computational analysis of historical data? And they have this book which is published as a book, proper book, but they have the first edition and the second edition free to get. Uh, you could go to the second edition, for example, click on it, right? Um, oops, sorry, what happened? Um, this is the code. Um, there's something wrong with my... Yeah, so first edition. Yeah, so you can go here. For some reason, the second edition is not opening. 
you can uh, see the chapters, the visualizations they have done, right? All of this, it's there. The essays, right? The code they have used. Um, So there are various chapters, various things, what they were doing, right? Um, you can get it all here. You can see their visualization. Uh, the whole book is available on uh, as a website uh, on the internet archive. You can go there and get the whole, read the whole book. It goes essay by essay telling you what to do. So you go to the internet archive and the whole book is there with all their chapters and everything, right? Everything. So you start, everything is here. The comments people have made, you can read the whole book. You can actually use this as a textbook to try and learn how to do things. So for example, they'll tell you, how to extract tables from PDFs? How do you clean data which you get if there are problems with the data? Basic text mining, how do you do word clouds, the limitations, how do you move beyond that? Right? What are the different types of visualizations? What do you do? How do you scrape your data? All of this is there. Right? Um, the theoretical discussions about this are there. The other thing you could actually look at is what is called the programming historian, which has 86 lessons in doing digital work. I mean, this is again history, but a lot of it is social sciences. I mean, all forms of social sciences, anybody can use it. These are historians who have done it, but you go here and, uh, oops, my, somehow my internet is a little slow today. Uh, those, problems of the digital world, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a, as I say, novice friendly peer review tutorials that help humanists learn about how to do various things. So you can learn their lessons. You, if you teach, you can contribute, write a lesson, be a reviewer, provide feedback. And of course they want you to also give them money, but if you go to their lessons, um, just give me a minute. I think there was some uh, maintenance work on our uh, internet system happening today, so maybe that's the reason it's, it's a little slow, but it should open soon enough. But definitely look at the historian's microscope, right? This one. Uh, this is what it is called. And go come and have a look here. So you have a bunch of tutorials on various aspects. And you can sort it by publication date, but you can also sort it by difficulty. So this is the... Easiest or no, this is actually, this is the easiest introduction to Jupyter Notebooks, Beginner's Guide on Twitter Data, the principles, how to use tabular data. Some of them you can use, some of them you will find difficult. Basic Windows command line, how to use that, what to use. Omeka is a great source. Um, Zotero is a great source. So these are, and if you open any of these, you will find, uh, say, for example, um, Beginner's Guide to Twitter Data, since a lot of people use Twitter. It 
it it is very detailed it is broken down it is like a university lecture it is almost like one of those open university things right uh, and there are 86 of them so oops okay so while it is difficult for us it is not impossible to do much more than most human sciences scholars do it tells you what are tweet sets how do you select filter export the data set how do you use them what are the applications right it will give you an overview it will give you various things about different sources you can use for this right so it is not easy i'm not saying it is easy you have to learn a completely new skill a lot of us maths challenged i barely managed to get through maths in school but now when you see this less of the maths we studied in school and more of formal logic and things like that it's with some effort possible to understand it you don't have to master it you have to master the ability to use the tool it's like typing or it's like writing any of these skills uh it's not impossible there is an effort you have to put in i can't say i am very good with a lot of these things thankfully i am in a computer science it institution my students do much of this but i need to be aware of what is happening thanks uh, aniket very much now there are a couple of uh, uh, similar kinds of question uh, so for example veta is asking you know this whole emphasis on ontological precision this definitional precision which computational analysis requires doesn't that kind of sights the whole politics of definition and assume a kind of ontological certitude so i mean what happens to this whole you know as social scientists and as 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 you you know human sciences people we are interested in that whole politics of you know those quibbles over definitions and so on so what happens to that when we kind of we begin with a certain kind of you know precision or a demand I, yeah so i don't think it goes away those things will remain and uh, even if you are using it in purely computer science so number one uh everything will not be computational uh the debate between habermas and charles taylor would remain uh that is not going to go away right which is why we get our students to read aristotle which is why we get our students to read rousseau and locke and hobbes about the social contract but when you are thinking of the social contract and when you are looking at constitutions it is possible to perhaps then define for particular purposes it's more precisely knowing that this precision is also temporary for the purposes it is context bound and that debate remains right but also my own sense in the last 5 years has been that uh, perhaps there has been a slippage uh, by humanists social scientists where uh, we have reveled so much in the complexity and the you know i mean you keep hearing uh, things are complicated and i want to complicate the issue and thing like that that sometimes we are forgetting the need also for precision and for drilling down uh, which is not to say one has to always do that we i'm not being a behavioralist i'm not uh being a uh, old school quantitative social scientist but i'm saying that it has its uses so we need to be conscious of the fact that it is context driven it is for particular purposes it will always be tentative it is always like all knowledge we open to challenge and criticism and transformation but uh, it is useful and often as we saw with poems or we saw with curiosity it helps us understand things So a slightly related questions being asked by Vaishnavi who's saying you know um so her question is you know uh, especially focused on the curiosity and the anger project the outreach project and so you know if we're not kind of looking at posts manually then how we're doing it but also if, when we're looking at these posts what happens when some of these posts may be in mixed languages or languages other than english or you know so for example english hmm? and how does 
how does this computational analysis then account for sar sarcasm or any other kinds of kind of emotions and sentiments which which may be very difficult to kind of pin down yeah yeah so that's the thing so in the last one year i have uh, been uh, an internal examiner for two theses which have looked at humor and sarcasm trying to identify humor and sarcasm there's a lot of work going on in that the simple part of your question uh when you download say for example the uh, tutorial i showed you about getting twitter data sets it will tell you it will so for example when you download twitter it will typically come in an excel sheet so it will give you time location so the date stamp time stamp the location stamp the handle the hashtags the text uh, all the other data will come down as an excel sheet and you might so for example the one we downloaded had it will tell you that it has so many tweets it will very easily these uh, things will tell you what are repetitions so there are retweets there are uh, quote tweets so all those will be classified for you without necessarily you having to do it manually right uh and sentiment analysis often you know so for example it cannot only be manual so when you look at it so when we are looking at anger it is difficult sometimes the same word is used in very different ways and particularly in social media there are words which are often used uh, in diametrically opposite ways uh, even without sarcasm and so there is need for human annotation that happens all the time you get a data set you have to annotate it manually sometimes it takes months to do that but then once you have done it the data set the program as it says is also learning that's what is called machine learning it constantly reads your annotation and it's learning from that so things like that you can easily do that. so for example to give you a different i haven't myself had students work on sarcasm and humor but i had students who did something very interesting looking at hindi film songs from hindi films uh, so how do we so how do we get that data set so what we did was we went and found that there is the uh, binaka geet mala which is happening from i think early 1950s amin siani made a big name for himself his voice is still recognized by a lot of people as binaka geet mala and then it became i think sibaka geet mala and so basically from 1955 to 2005 we looked at the top 20 songs of each year in the binaka geet mala then we took the text of those songs from a repository which got all the lyrics there and then we were looking at passive voice and active voice and we were doing a gender segregation so how many times does a woman use a passive voice and how many times the man uses a passive voice and active voice it was very interesting and uh, how many times does a man a woman sing a non romantic song or how many times does a man sing a non romantic song and then words like you know nation and state and duty and uh, sacrifice etc etc we're looking at those things and that gives you a sentiment analysis that gives you a sense of the cultural world and we found some very interesting things about how the nation is being referred to what are gender roles etc etc now that is not the entire story you need us to also engage with that data as we traditionally have done but the scope of doing this now is so large and this whole project that i'm talking about was done by two computer science students while they were doing four other courses in one semester otherwise it would have taken a whole phd and longer if you wanted to do that without using computational tools i don't know whether that answers your question uh, i was actually also reading this here so um yeah uh, thanks aniket i'm sure it's given them a lot to think about uh, and in the spirit of not having precise precision <laughs> to everything <laughs> and uh, now there are a couple of questions which uh, you know which kind of ask you to share your thoughts on cyber security and uh, you know privacy of data etc and, and what are your thoughts on this you know using these you know computer applications but how how, how can one ensure that there is data protection and uh, you know security of uh, data and so i actually don't work 
on privacy and data protection. So my understanding of that is from what I uh, uh, get from uh, uh, you know reading the newspaper, reading some activist blogs, and you know following a few people here and there um, on Twitter and things like that. Um, but one thing I can tell you is that um, uh, when uh, some people write that uh, based on your metadata, just on the fact that you're carrying uh, the biggest, I mean, irrespective of what you use, if you don't have WhatsApp, you don't have Instagram, which are the worst offenders, our Facebook, uh, you know, the, as they're called the Facebook uh, Trinity, if, even if you don't have that in your phone, you just have the phone with the basic apps in it, and you're walking around, it's with you all the time. Um, it Within a couple of weeks, it knows more about you and can predict what you're going to do far better than you yourself. That is the baseline. You can't get away from that. It is impossible. In fact, uh, what I was told recently that most cars now, if you, in India, for example, the, the sort of thing is about an 8 lakh rupee. If you are around the 7, 8 lakh rupee margin, if you go above that, the cars immediately identify the driver. They won't tell you, but they know who's driving the moment within the first 60 seconds. Because how you're pressing the clutch, how you're putting the gear, where, at what speed you're turning the steering, etc., etc., they know who that. That's all. That's the metadata they know, need to know who you are. They're profiling you constantly. Now, is it a problem? In parts, it is. It defend, depends on what you call privacy. Um, we know for a fact that Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, which is the Facebook uh, uh, platforms, regularly have shared uh, data which should be private with states and commercial actors. We know that uh, Google has, when given legal subpoenas in certain countries, so Google doesn't say no. We know Apple has at times less than Google, but it still has. We know those things. Does Amazon Alexa or Google Home or Siri uh, send your data? Is there somebody sitting and reading? Nobody does that. They just, nobody has the bandwidth to be able to do that. It is all automated. Nobody even knows. Nobody in Amazon knows why it is being, some product is being suggested to you. It is happening through a black box. It's intuition. It's, it's exactly like intuition. So you don't know why do you intuit something? Is it because of astrological reasons? Because some planet or star is somewhere in the horizon? Or is it because a spirit came and spoke to you or God came and spoke to you or what is it? You don't know. It's a black box. We call it intuition. And today, artificial intelligence, machine learned artificial intelligence is working on intuition. They are suggesting things to you which are often wrong. Like our own intuition is often wrong, but often they are right. You are in the mood for an ice cream and up there is ice cream being suggested to you. So, Privacy in the way we understand it, because unfortunately, our political and uh, psychological understanding of privacy, for that matter, the legal understanding of privacy is very, not even 20th century, very 19th century. It's the classic utilitarian, limited state um, concept of privacy, which is not a bad concept at all. but uh, that's not how it's working anymore. Um, how do we think of privacy, both as political theory, as everyday practice, as law? I don't know. But we need to think about it. What I know is metadata is being constantly taken. You just go and look at the metadata that WhatsApp picks up. The metadata that Google is picking up from this meeting is massive. And we are all being profiled constantly. But then, Aniket, uh, my question would be: what, what are the kind of ethical concerns that come into play when we are look when we are doing this kind of analysis? You know, when we are looking at metadata as, as researchers, what 
possibly could be the kind of ethical things. Yeah, I mean, so one has to be uh, keep the same. I think as of now, for the type of social science research that we do, uh, we have to keep the same ethical uh, codes of conduct that uh, social science research has. So if you are looking at certain things which are private, then you need to go through an ethics committee. You need to find out how you're anonymizing, what the data is, how is it kept, who has access to it, when is it destroyed? The idea that all data has to be preserved for all times is also something which needs to be questioned. So when is data kept? When is data destroyed? How much of it is kept? Uh, so, for example, we have, uh, uh, when we collected data in Spiti, we went and interviewed about 160 families spread over 25 villages. And those forms have the names of the family, but uh, the data that we have on our Excel sheet doesn't have the name of the family. But somebody who lives in Spiti by looking at the data we have collected, how many cars you have, how much land, what does grow on that land, uh, how many people from your family are in the monastery, et cetera, et cetera, would know who, which family we are talking about, even if that is anonymized, right? So, so those are the same ethical concerns, say, for example, sociologists and uh, market researchers or anthropologists, everybody is worked with. So we need to do those very things. Uh, we are working with those very things. For example, now we have this whole project uh, on the India Social Archive. We have just started. We have started with collecting data on the farmers' movement. Everything, all newspapers, all tweets, all Facebook posts, all government uh, documents, uh, laws. Uh, we'll try and get into jurisprudence on agriculture and farm laws and everything else. Uh, collected and kept. But then the question is, who has access, how much, what anonymity, etc. So right now we are with public data. So if you're picking up Twitter, if you're picking up Facebook, it's public data. But everything on Facebook is not public data. They can be private conversations. So what we are picking up are public groups, which everybody can join and everybody can read. But what happens to private conversations? What happens to... So it's like, you know, what happens to letters that Mahatma Gandhi wrote to his son? People do need that. It's personal. Um, yeah. So till now, historians have worked with the 30 year uh, uh, period that, you know, 30 years and then it's in the archives, it's public. But we don't know. People live beyond 30 years. Um, somebody told me that uh, the 30 year rule was put in the, 19, uh, in the 19th century when the average life expectancy was 30 years. <laughs> I don't know whether it's true or not. It's just an urban legend. But of course, now that is not true anymore, even if that was an urban legend. But it still remains 30 years. So I'm 50 years. My misspent 20s might be public knowledge if, you know, uh, all the things I wrote, my letters, my uh, public documents, will they be in the archives for everyone to go and pick up? I mean, those are ethical concerns. Those are privacy concerns. Okay, so Chaitanya has a question, but I think, uh... you know, the concerns about disruptive technology, such as the, you know, the internet was in the 90s, and now you can talk about the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency doing a similar kind of thing. Uh, so her question is, several disruptive technologies, both in the present and past, pose fundamental challenge as how research is understood, conducted and operate within existent modes of analysis, which may or may not necessarily fully be able to accommodate the breadth and nuance of technology itself. So it's so her, her concern is coming in on that, whether the research may in some manner flatten the technology, when it's supposedly a disruptive technology. I think uh, Manisha, wow. I was just standing in. <laughs> So I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, 
I'm still grappling with a lot of this. Uh, everything I say is tentative, so I don't know. But I think uh, it is true. I mean, it is uh, it is something now which is not a debate anymore that we need to rethink methods, we need to rethink protocols, we need to rethink what is publishing, we need to rethink uh, how as a community we work because you know knowledge production always happens in collaboration and a bit of competition. So we all are working on similar things. We are competing with each other to find a better way to understand, but it is always collaborative. Uh, it's never competitive in the sense the free market thinks of it. It's always that we are working together to, you know, uh, find answers to similar questions or find answers to the same thing from different directions. Um, that uh, those protocols of collaboration, those protocols of competition, those protocols of sharing, those protocols of uh, privacy of knowledge and information, uh, definitely, I agree, are changing. Um, whether it uh, flattens research, is that what was said? I um, I don't know what exactly does flattens research mean. Uh, but yeah, it uh, in some ways it takes away some of the things we could do. We did without computers, some of the manner in which we work. It also, I think, opens up uh, uh, whole possibilities. Uh, a reality which we didn't even know existed. It's like a reality we didn't know existed till electricity came. So you couldn't go beyond the visual microscope. But now, of course, you can look and see the structure of an atom. Um, that possibility, that reality, a different level of reality is possible and that changes everything else that we see. So I don't know whether it patterns. Chetana has a hand raised. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah, there's a hand raised. Chetana, do you want to type in your question or do you want to speak out? No, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, yeah, just do that. No, so uh, I just wanted to quickly chip in. Um, so I think when understanding disruptive technologies, one concern is that we always run the risk of accommodating those technologies within the prevailing understanding we have of those technologies to work with. So say, for example, just to simply take the example of Bitcoin, of how we understand value in society or how we understand, say, for example, how trust works and intermediaries work, which allow for, say, banks to exist. When, when these technologies erupt, they sort of uh, fundamentally challenge how our society functions on a day-to-day -day basis. So in that sense, the first question or first concern is how does research then, in one sense, curtail our own understanding of the technology or what it can offer society? And the second question is a little more open-ended, both to Professor Aniket and Professor Danda, where um, how do we then, once this research is undertaken, how do we convey this research? Because I feel it holds very important implications to how the larger society understands this research and then intends on working with it. How do be it either accepting the technology or rejecting it thereof? Um, these are some. Uh, these are the two questions I was uh, attempting to pose yeah. for you, Professor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I. I think I understood it slightly differently earlier. Um, yeah, Bitcoins, for example, the role of the state. Now, um, it was interesting because when I started reading up on Bitcoins, I was also, uh, this was previous to joining IIIT, I had been looking at corruption. And uh, as you would remember, 10 years ago, uh, corruption was the big thing. I mean, you know, uh, that brought a whole government down. And it's not the first time there was uh, anti-corruption movements in the late 80s. There were anti-corruption movement in the mid 70s, uh, each of which brought uh, government down. And uh, you had this whole thing of uh, corruption coming up and I was looking at corruption. And one of the things that got me looking through that was the manner in which the um, uh, economic system happened in India and this whole thing of contracts being validated by a state which sits outside of the um, society is a very European thing because if you look at how trade and mercantile and fiscal both exchanges happened in 
historically what is called india and central asia the you know the indies uh, from iran right up to the southeast asia from central asia down to ceylon the whole area east africa uh, the state wasn't involved the state wasn't guaranteeing contracts there were these hawala and hundi systems credit networks which were based on caste which were based on uh, honor which were based on marriage ties uh the state wasn't involved in uh, guaranteeing contracts and in some ways it was not of course like cryptocurrency but it was something similar because uh, the trust reposed in the network and even if one or two of the elements of that network broke that whole trust would collapse and we are going back to something like this so yes it is disruptive in some ways but maybe it is also going back in a digital form to patterns of trade and financial exchange which are pre modern how do we deal with this disruptive thing how do we explain this that is the big challenge for social sciences i have no idea i mean we have to learn a new language we have to learn a language which can express even if we are not computer scientists and none of i suppose most of us here maybe with a few exceptions are not computer scientists how do we explain that how do we talk about it how do we bring some bits of code into what we are writing how do we do that as social scientists that this code has a problem with this and that code doesn't because of this just like uh, we learn how to talk about formal logic we learn how to talk about some parts of economics we learn how to talk about certain anthropological issues i think some of those things we have to learn there's no no escaping that uh, it's not going to happen overnight uh, it's maybe not even going to happen in a generation but it is something it's an agenda which is there you cannot escape it so some of those how do explain this explainable ai is a small part of this larger process of how do you talk about this even among ourselves as academics but to the wider world and as uh, phd scholars i think it's a great thing to keep that in mind foreground it when you start your research well uh, chetanya the way i would process your question is that see one of the things that we are always doing when we are doing research is we are questioning existing models so when we start to do that questioning through a route which cannot really be you know like cannot be traversed without questioning those models uh i don't i mean i i see it more as an opportunity than a problem in the sense of like it it is that because some things which you thought were totally undoable or inaccessible have become accessible in what way do they open up things for us which couldn't be done without like i would sort of turn even with vetha pelos uh, philosophers question on its head when he said oh you know like if you are going to be like going for this sort of precision in definition then are you not in some way killing that entire ontological nuance the way i would see it is this that the very fact that you can people that definition in so many different ways demonstrates to you that what the limitations of defining always is and you can demonstrate it in a more concrete manner it's not just your opinion so i would somewhere answer it more from there that yes evidently when you take a new route certain kinds of things are going to going to arise which could not arise from the earlier route but this new route by the very fact that it is getting some questions to be to be raised which couldn't be raised without it it i mean i'm going back to my presentation the one which i did where i said one of the big difficulties or uh, is to actually find the problem when you are doing research so when you go you are trying to traverse a, a, a use a methodology which is necessarily going to be problematic i think it's it's an opportunity that this technology gives or this uh, this particular joining of law and technology gives you at least that's how i would understand it yeah yeah i think that's, that's a very good way of putting uh it i think that's exactly it i mean it's uh, 
Yeah, I'm not question I see. Nobody is denying that this it will be problematic, but if it was not problematic, then we would not research it. Right. <laughs> right. And I think all all methods come with you know inbuilt yeah. limitations. Obviously. And I, I think, yeah. See, I think I keep this, every method cannot do anything and exactly. amongst the, cannot do everything and amongst the things that we have been telling or we will be continuing to repeat it on a again and again basis is that you construct your methodology so depending upon the answer you want you have to determine whether this speaks to you whether there is some problem you always had which this particular technique gives you an opportunity to try to find an answer uh, if it if that happens, then this speaks to you. Otherwise, at least you just got yourself an exposure on the okay other people's work of this kind you can use for your work. Maybe you are not doing it yourself. Both both kinds of advantages are always there. It's not necessary that every piece of valuable work has to be done by me. So other people's valuable work can be can help me in going further in my work without me having to do it. I hope this is helps you, Chaitanya, to get at least to think further. Yes, Professor. Thank you. These aren't easy questions. Um, I think we'll all we're all grappling with it. But thank you for sharing your insights and opinions. So, Burhan has a question. I think it's an earlier question. Uh, well, he was asking about. I mean, it's not uh, necessary for Aniket to really answer it because it's a question that everybody must grapple with. I mean, he talks about yeah. the fact that in China there have been these artificial intelligence court set up. So, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? See, the point is uh, uh, coming it, uh, to it from something else. For example, um, uh, a doctor friend of mine was telling me he he's uh, uh, he, he does uh, uh, some sort of a computer aided uh, surgery of the nervous system, brains. Things like that. So they'll put a pipe in through your veins, and that pipe will go with a camera, with little scissors, with uh, needles, God knows what else, and do whatever it has to do inside the brain, and then come out through. Anyhow, so he was saying this is done much better by robots and artificial intelligence. But the problem is, we really don't know why robots are taking certain decisions to do certain things and not do other things. And in all such surgeries, the human body is so complex that it will react in ways which you don't know. So sometimes, the instead of going along a certain vein, the robo would send uh, the um, uh, these tools through another vein, and which might lead to uh, complications and the patient dies. Now, if the doctor human being is doing it, you can explain it. We are doing it for this reason. If a robo is asked to do a surgery of your kidney, it will make a puncture and put in uh, its equipment and do certain things and come out. Most likely it's going to be successful. In the few cases it is not successful, when somebody can sue the hospital or the doctor for negligence or anything else, the doctor can explain right or wrong why they did it. The problem with these robots is with artificial intelligence is it's a black box. We don't know through what basis they have made that decision. It's the same with mathematical proof. So there are a bunch of mathematical problems with AI has within quote solved. They work, but we don't know whether they have been solved. Because solution means that somebody else has to go through all those steps, even if it takes a year and 500 pages. Somebody should be able to follow all those steps and say, yes, all those steps are right. And step number 17,348 is actually not a problem. I should be able to say that. And then at the end say, yes, your proof is right. And yeah, this is a solution to this problem, which has been there for 400 years in mathematics. Now the AI has solved it, it gives you a solution which seems to work in every condition you put it in, but you don't know. Is it fluke or is it actually solved? Because the solution is not there. The same problem with 
legal things. So, for example, I was talking about this dowry thing. I got a student to start working with me. She left and started doing something else with another uh, colleague of mine. Uh, she wasn't interested in that. But what we had managed to do in less than three weeks was to download all jurisprudence for the last 20, 25 years or something from all the high courts of India relating to dowry. And then done a quick text analysis to try and identify, you know, certain things. So, for example, Maruti car, gold, mother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law, husband, um, fire, suicide, uh, kerosene, um, hanging, uh, various things, uh, suicide note, all these things were coming up. So, you could actually build a whole set of things about what is happening and find patterns and trends. Now, of course, uh, different high courts have different levels of digitization. Some of them are very bad PDFs, uh, real problems in uh, analyzing those texts. Some of them are really good, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the real action actually, as we, I, I mean, you would know better than me, most of you is it, it's actually happening at a level lower than the high courts which are mostly not digitized. So can we digitize them? Are they getting digitized? How do we get access to them even they're being digitized? What happens to privacy? What happens to questions of, um, you know, uh, protecting uh, people of, uh, you know, all those issues. But yet you could do that. You could look at trends and help so, for example, it becomes much easier for officers of the court to know past precedents, what has happened, under what conditions, et cetera, et cetera, on your fingertips. It's like medical technology, right? So now you have so many technologies. You go to a doctor and you say, uh, I have a sore throat, I have this, I have red eyes, uh, I have a problem with hypertension. I have no diabetes, but I had so-and-so illness at one time. I have taken these vaccines and it will give you probability of illnesses. You can get them on your phone, often free. All these things, especially COVID times, all these things are going around. It's the same thing. The back end, the analysis is the same as legal AI, robotic judges. It's the same thing. You find all these patterns and you say that, in 90% of the cases, this is what the pattern shows. So you say, oh, most likely you have malaria. You may not. There's always the possibility, but it helps the doctor predict. You may not have COVID, but it will tell you, it might be COVID. Get yourself tested. That's what these things do. Basically, that's what they do. The problem is, in China, there is nobody to ask questions. Um, but uh, in most other legal regimes, it, the judgment leads to be open to scrutiny. As of now, we do not have explainable AI. So we cannot do that. For legal research, some of these things we can do, we can find patterns. For social services, we can find patterns and say, okay, under these conditions, there's a high likelihood of child abuse. There's a high likelihood of dowry violence. There's a high likelihood of X and Y. Police is already using this. This is a high likelihood of crime in certain areas. Problems of privacy, of course. Problems of overreach, of course. But those are not things which technology per se does. Those are political questions which we need to answer extra technology. Yes, thank you, Aniket. Perhaps this itself is a, I mean, good theme to research on. You know, how do these robotic justices uh, work, and you know, uh, and the kind of differences and patterns between these AI courts and other courts. I mean, that that itself may be a very rich field of study itself. Yes. So I think we've come to the end of questions now, and I, um, if Zadanda, we have a five seven minutes open house where anybody can ask switch on their microphone and ask a question yeah. if they want. Sure. If not, then we will just thank uh, Aniket, thank everyone else and close. So please unmute yourself if you wish to speak. Uh, this was just a follow-up. 
question. So, like when I was asking about the distinction, my concern was that sometimes you don't want the framework. Like for example, uh, what Mr. Anikhet was saying about uh, uh, the sport, non-sport. I, for one, think the Jalika two is not something which can be analyzed using the sport, non-sport distinction. So, like, but uh, you said that it is contextual and uh, subject to revision. It's still, it's like you're still assuming that that my like it's a sport or not. That we will eventually find something uh, uh, which clearly distinguishes the board. And when uh, Professor Amita was uh, uh, was saying that you know uh, that you heard, uh, uh, that the, just the way that you offer a new definition say uh, says that it is not ontologically certitude like. But the framework can be uh, remains right. Like sometimes Jalika too. Like I, like the scholars who argue that religion as an analytical framework cannot be used uh, in for other in context other than Christians. Now, how do we account for these uh, limitations when we are doing uh, this? But why do you say Jalika too cannot be analyzed as a sport? People have oh. used uh, bullfighting uh, as analysis. You know, there are various other sports which can be done. I'm sure yes. thinking of what Dalikattu does or uh, say cockfights, uh, whatever else are ethical issues with that are or not, right? Uh, I'm keeping that aside. Uh, cockfights can very easily be categorized and analyzed as sports. Uh, so, like my question, most stems from my limited research in law and religion, where we try to find a distinction between religion and secular. And there are a lot of anthropologists who argue that you know, when you're looking at tribal uh, tribal customs and all, they're not yes. capable of being distinguished that way. So sometimes the framework that we use and we that we're trying to refine the framework, but we miss the point that the framework might not be applicable in other places. Mm. But uh, Veta, won't you create your own framework? You know, if you look at I, I don't get that. So, of course, I can understand that people who are participating in something uh, create meanings of their own, which are uh, not necessarily amenable to uh, uh, an understanding which comes from outside and tries to impose. Uh, Foreign conceptual categories on that. I can understand that argument, but uh, if we build a, a, a structure, a, a formal structure of uh, definitions of what is sport, uh, that would uh, be open to all human or even non-human activity. That's the whole interesting thing, and it need not be. It could be, right? Uh, so you could say that Jalikattu is a sport, yet it is culturally significant, or it is unethical, or it is illegal. Those are different things. It is important part of the cultural world in which meanings are created for a certain set of people. All those things are still possible and are not obviated by the fact of saying that, yes, it is like a form of sport. Like I was giving the example of Bombay suburban trade travel. I mean, it could well be considered a form of sport and something else may not be, which we think is sport, right? Thank you, Thank you Professor. All right, it looks like we've come to the end of the afternoon. And uh, it has been, I think, mind-blowing mind in several kinds of ways. I really want to be thanking you, Aniket, for triggering these thought processes for all of us, not just for the aspirants, but the rest of us who are listening in to feel that this is something we need to be engaging with. So I once again thank you on behalf of uh, Nalsa University. Thanks, Manisha Sethi, who on a Sunday with Nena 
tugging at her pallu is still kind of done an amazing moderation job so thank you everybody see you all next week uh, thank the, you thank you for inviting me next week's uh, things would be different we will notify them for you because one speaker is from australia and the other is from england so we going to have some timings adjustments coming in thank you once more on anke that was a lovely evening thank you thank oh, you so much pleasure and it was really nice being here thank you